<laughs> All right. So the games we've been reviewing lately are the games that we can easily play semi-asynchronously online. Yep. And uh, the synchronously games online are difficult because you need to get a lot of people together with technology and such and such. Asynchronous games are on websites. You take your turn whenever you got time. Yep. You can do it while you're at work, right? You're, you're while you're at work in quotes, right? Yeah. You know, you do you do some work and then ding, it's your turn. You look over, you take your turn in a browser, you turn back, back to your work, right? Perfect game for stuck at home. Yep. So we've been playing these train games and now we moved on to a game that I've known about for a long time. Like I kind of knew the deal. I've heard, the, I've heard the name of it before. But, uh, I'd seen it, but I just hadn't played it. And because of all the things we said about 1889 and 1846 and 2038, those three reviews you can read or listen to, uh, there are transcriptions on YouTube, it looks like. I didn't check how good they are, but I saw them there. (laughs) But uh, you can check those reviews out. But one of our complaints about the train games is around how we really like the stock stuff more so than the operating round is almost just like bookkeeping. Mm -hmm. So now we played Rolling Stock where... The bookkeeping and the so-called operating round is abstracted away to almost nothing. And this game is basically just about the companies and the stock shenanigans. Right. So in most of the 18x train games, you start the game with some sort of auction for private companies. And as the game goes on, those private companies are folded into public companies and they disappear. And that's the end of them. They're sort of like their purpose is that in a, in a non-random game, because they're not these games have no randomness whatsoever, right? To sort of start the game in an asymmetric way, right? Um, you know, not just the turn order already provides some asymmetry, but the fact that you have to start by auctioning off these unique private companies yep. and everyone gets however many they end up buying, right? Means that everyone starts in an asymmetric position, which sort of is then the the spark that sets off the asymmetric non-random game yep right? like the like the grain of sand inside of a pearl exactly so uh in rolling stock the way this game works is much like the 18xx games and it starts off with an auction for private companies but that auction for private companies continues throughout the game there is a stack of private companies and they keep turning out new ones and each turn one of the phases the, the important phase where most of the game happens is an auction for the currently available private companies between all of the players. Only the players can use their money in this auction, right? The money in your personal wallet. The corp- the public corporations that absorb the private companies, right, cannot bid in this auction, yep. right? So what happens is the flow of the game is people start with money. There's no public companies whatsoever. You participate in these auctions to acquire private companies. The private companies spit out money. But much like th- these private companies, while also serving the purpose of the private companies in, a- in other 18xx games, they also serve as abstractions of the trains. Yep. Right? Like there's no they trains. They have just an income and they have synergies with other companies. Like every company well, will have well, synergies with some of the other companies and have their. Well, hold on. You're getting ahead of yourself uh, here, right? So the private companies spit out money and they rust like the trains do. Over time, the amount of money they spit out goes down. Yep. So like a company right? will make and you, you have to get rid of. They'll give you income like three dollars every turn. You just get three dollars. Awesome. That's cool. Right. But then as the game goes on, their income drops and drops and eventually becomes negative. Yeah. And then you want to dump them, much like the trains in an 18xx game. You get a train. The train that you bought that a company bought generates revenues that turn into dividends, and then. The train rusts and it goes out of the game and you have to buy new trains. Also, in an 18xx game, you usually have tracks, right? And what the tracks do is, you know, based on your position on the board, sort of determines how much money different trains can get, right? Two companies might have the same trains, but one with a better board position might be spitting out more money because it's better aligned on the map. Rolling stock, the private companies, again, abstract away the map because they have the synergies that Rim mentioned. Yep, so company right? A, if you, if you own both company A and company B together in a corporation, they bo- they get like a little bonus to how much income they generate. Right, so company A, if you just hold on to it privately to yourself, will spit out X dollars. Company B might also just spit out X dollars. You hold on to them yourself and you just get the income that they spit out until they rust and you get rid of them. But no big deal, right? But if that was the whole game, then the whole game would just be 
bid for the best private companies the end yep. and hold on, right? There would be no public company. It would basically just be Pizarro what? or it would just be the auctions and power grid and nothing else. Right. So what you do is you form public companies. You can form them just whenever arbitrarily. I like kind of like that. There's not like these specified ones like 18XX yep. says. You just, you just like, I'll, I'll start the bear company. I'll start the wheel company, whatever, right? Um, and when you start those companies, you have a, they have a stock price, right? Because now they're public. People can buy shares. You issue shares. Money goes into the company. It has its own wallet. Yep. Uh, and the co corporation that's public can absorb the private corporations. And in fact, to form one, you must start by putting a private company into it. And then uh, that income that the private company was spitting out now goes into the public company's wallet. But if... a private companies that synergize with each other because they are abstractly in good positions together on the map that doesn't exist, yep. right? They go well together. They will spit out bonus dollars that add up to a lot of dollars. And the fiction is like so. these two railways interconnect with each other or like this airline would actually overlap with like these rail routes that complete. But honestly, the theme literally does not matter at all. These are just acronyms no. that synergize with other acronyms and they all have colors. Right, but if the right acronyms get into the same company together, more money comes out. So by starting the public company, you can get more value right from those synergies than just holding on to money fountains for your personal gain. Yep. Now starting now other now starting that, a company, like starting a corporation, is pretty cool because it's a real IPO. Like if you do it, you put your you put the company that you own personally into this corporation. You pick one, like Bear or Wheel. Yeah, it go it goes public. Yep. Right? And the the way the IPO works is basically you get a share, and the bank gets a share, and you pay your money to the company for that share, and the bank pays its money to the company for that share. So by IPOing, you basically get other investors in. So now the company has more cash than just what you put into it. The whole point of an IPO yep. is to raise capital. It does. It's a pretty elegant mechanism how it works. And then what you can also do is, you know, you started this, you know, I took one of my companies that I won at auction, right? I put it into the company. It went public, right? And in exchange, because I gave up a private company, it's no longer under my control. I'm given a share in that company. So I didn't really lose anything yep. because that share has the value is the is the exchange I get for the company I put? You in. also pick the but, price the company opens at. What is the starting price of this stock? Yeah. Well, if you're the president, yeah, you can issue more shares, all this stuff. But the point is, is that now that the public company has one private company in it, it the way it gets more private because in order to have the synergies, it has to have more than one private company in it. Uh -huh. right? The way it gets more than one is that you can, if you're the president, right, you can decide which private companies that public company will buy with its money just acquisition so you can buy them right? from other corporations or you can buy them from players which means if you're the president of a company you can buy a corporation that you the player own directly and just agree to it you can just be corrupt as right. hell and that right that is basically the flow of the game as you buy private companies in this auction corporations public ones cannot participate in the auction therefore you take your money you buy companies you put some of them into a they go public together, create synergy to create more value. You then get money out, right? This is the important part because you have to make sure because the only way you can participate in the auctions for more companies is if you personally have money in your wallet, right? Owning shares, you can't use that money in an auction unless you sell the share and you can't sell your last share in a corporation. You know, money that's in the company's wallet, right? Because it got a, it because the bank bought some shares, right? Which gave the company money yep. that you can't use that to buy companies at the auction. You need money in your personal wallet to participate in the auction. And then you buy companies in the auction. And now, well, now you don't have enough money to buy another company, yep. right? You sell the company you bought to the corporation to get the money out of the corporate wallet into your personal wallet for the next auction. Yep, there's only four and ways to get money into your personal wallet. Like there's not a lot of ways to get money back in this game. You either no. you either own a company that's just spitting out revenue, which is not going to help you in the long run. Like it helps some, depends. Yeah, but you probably depends. companies that don't have. If a company isn't really doing any synergy, then there's really I don't see much reason to have it be in a public company. You might as well just keep it on your own because. Yep. I guess unless you right. use the IPO to have more money than you could have otherwise to acquire something somewhere else. Yeah, if you use, you might want to use a, a low synergy company as the IPO company, but yeah, otherwise, it's, you're gonna get the better value just by holding yep. it. Right, you can 
Uh, like Scott said, you can buy companies. Your corporation can buy companies from you or other players. Corporations might buy a company from you if that's the one yeah, they want. You can buy any which way. All, always. Yep. Number three, every round, one of the things you do is decide how many dividends to issue. So if you say the dividend is $4, the corporation pays $4 to each shareholder on record, which, as you might recall, since the bank gets half the shares, unless other people have bought shares, you own a share and a bank owes the share. If you do a dividend of $4, you get $4, the bank gets $4, the company loses $8. Right. The other way is... Obviously, it's a stock game. You can own shares that increase in value and then sell yep. them. Now, this is where the game but is That is hard. 18, That's very hard 18xx games have a abstracted and like, it's so abstracted that it's realistic, but only in an obtuse way, stock market. Uh, most games mm -hmm. have just completely fake stock markets. The stock market, the way stock prices work in this game is shockingly realistic. It's pretty real. It's not 100% real because it's still an abstract But it's game, real close to the real world because basically... There's a lot of parts. There's a lot of parts of it that are very I'll real. I'll describe it vaguely because right. you can read the rules. Like, we'll just link to a PDF. If someone buys... Uh, there's, a, there's a line of prices. No two stocks can have the same price. Yep. Right? If someone buys a share, you go up to the next available price, which might mean jumping over other companies if they have the prices that are right in front of you. Right? When you sell a share, it moves down in price to the next available price. Yep. Um, however, if when you buy a share, right, it moves up, but you pay where it moved yep, to. Yep, the price that's... And when that, you sell, you get the money of where it moved yep. to. You don't get the money of where it moved from. Just like the real stock market. The price you see, if you look at what's the price of a stock, that's just the last price it traded at effectively. So say Star mm -hmm. Corporation is sitting at $28. I want to buy a share. The next price up on the chart is 31. So it costs $31 to buy a share. And then the price becomes 31. I want to buy another share? I got to pay 34 more dollars and the price moves up to 34. Yep. You don't, and it, whereas in 18XX, it's like you can sell five shares all at once. You get the price that is, you get the list price for all those shares. And then the price moves down a whole Which bunch. I guess in and olden got, times and shitty so like early stock markets, yeah. you could do stuff like that. Like I sell Scott a share and then before Scott can tell anyone, I send a rider on a horse to sell Joey Jojo a share and I sell them sure. both the shares at the same price. Right. And until they talk yeah, to each other, like, they have no idea they got screwed. Right. But in 18XX, if the price of a, a company is a hundred and you got four shares, you can sell all four and get $400 well, in this game. It's like, you no, know, you go around buying or selling one share at a time the only annoying rule is you can't sell the final share of a company yep. if no one else has a share in it. Um, and then, yeah, you can just buy one, sell one, buy one, yep. sell one. But obviously, if you buy, sell, buy, sell, you're just losing hemorrhage. You're just hemorrhaging just money. Just like in the real <laughs> stock market, the whole idea of a bid right. ask. Like, you know, the spread, there's a bid price and an ask price. Right. The price is 20. I'll buy a share. Well, you paid 21. All right. Well, now I'll sell that share. Here's $20. You lost a yep. dollar, right? The price is 20 again. It's like, uh, so yeah. That's how that yep. works. And then, so but, in order, to make, the other in order thing, to make money in stocks, you need to buy several shares of a company, issue more of them, then issue dividends over a long period of time, right? And you have to make sure, though, that the total value of the company itself, there's these little charts on each of the stock prices cards, right? That's why they're unique. And it will tell you if your company is this much value at the end of the turn, it will move up one, up two, down one, or down two, Right, so the val the total value of the company's holdings, which is its cash, it's cash on hand, plus the value of all the companies it owns. Right, the the total value of what the company has going on determines relative to its stock price whether it's undervalued or overvalued, and that will. Move. So if your company so if you has a ton of cash but not a lot of companies, you can pay out big dividends, and that stock price is gonna tank because the investors right. know that you just have a bunch of cash and you're squandering it. But if the company has like super low cash, right? And, but it has a ton of companies in it, then it's, first of all, those companies are generating probably a lot of synergistic income every yep. turn that you can pay out in dividends. Uh, but whether it did do or not, those companies have value and thus the stock price will move according to that value to the right position, regardless of where it started. It'll slowly get to where it belongs yep. uh, relative to how much it's worth. So if you can buy low and sell high, you can make money by selling shares at the right time. As long as you were able to issue enough shares, I made the mistake in the first game. I opened a company. It had two shares, one for me, one for the bank. 
no one else bought a share. I didn't issue more. I couldn't buy more. So my price went way up, but I could never sell my only yep. share of the company, even though it was very valuable. And even worse, if you and issue... I couldn't make any money and I couldn't buy, participate in the auction and then I was if done. If you issue new shares, that drives the price down and it dilutes your dividend. So if I issue another share, now there's three shares. Issue another share, now there's four shares. Every time you issue a share, the bank gives the share price to the company. Like you issued another share, it's out there. But now, if I pay a dividend, if there's five shares out there, a $1 dividend costs me $5, and if I only own one share, I only get one of those dollars. All right, so the things about this game... Uh, and there's more rules, but like that, that's pretty much right. the game. Well, the one, the one key thing is that those private companies that come out in the auction yep. right, are set up in a deck, and they're set up into different sections of different colors... And as the you get to the each color is like the next phase of the game, right? As the colors are you get through each set of colors, um, and while each little set is shuffled, the colors are in a certain order. So the companies just get more expensive as the game goes yep. on. The price keeps going, and it's up. huge. Like early so, companies have an income of like two, and it costs like eight dollars. The later companies have an income like a way out, like an income of like twelve, and they cost like sixty dollars to buy. There are big, big jumps between the colors, right? Big jumps. So the result of that is that not even if you're uh, competing well with the other players in the game, right? The game can beat you, right? If you don't keep enough money in your wallet, if you don't have a way to get money into your personal coffers, you and they get to like the next color, the prices on those co companies in the next color might be so high that you have no conceivable, no possible route, literally no possible route to ever be able to buy one of those, even if nobody was competing with you in the auction. Yep. Because you just, it's just like, well, that costs $40 minimum. There is no way for me to ever get $40 ever in this game. I'm just done, right? You have to play this game in such a way that you stay afloat, right? It's like, you're not fighting with the other people so much, right? You're trying to tread water. And after you successfully continue to tread water as the seas continuously rise and never stop rising, if you can continue treading water and stay alive in the game, then you can fight with the other people and try to dunk their heads up. Yep, right? but... You have, if I just, the first game I played, I just drowned on my yep. own. We both, Scott you and know? I just, down, like we both hit a point where, well... There's literally no way for us to ever buy anything for the rest of this game. Yep. So I think that the problems I see in this game, because uh, it does have a lot yeah, of fun we, parts. I enjoy right? this it... game. I would play it again. I want to play it again. However, I think it is deeply and fatally flawed in a number of ways that some people may be tolerant of, but I'm definitely not. You know, in Power Grid, right. we've talked about this a long time ago. Power Grid's a really fun game, but once you get good at it, like really good at it, the game literally comes down to, I spent 100% of my dollars this turn. Scott had $1 left over that turn. Scott's probably losing the game now because the game becomes very dollar tight. Like, that's the level of granularity of success. This game, right. but Power Grid is only like that at high tiers of play. This game is like that no matter what. If you are off by a dollar in the first auction, you might just mathematically be eliminated from the game. Right, so I think that, you know, I'm not opposed to being eliminated from the game. I know a lot of people hate player uh, elimination. I love it. Uh, right, I think this game, one of its flaws, it doesn't have player elimination. It needs it because you could be stuck in a game where you literally cannot affect the game anymore, but you are not officially eliminated. And so if you wanted to play to the official conclusion of the game, every game we've played of this it's has reached a point where we've just said, oh yes, obviously that player is won and there's nothing anyone could do about it, even though the game is far from officially over and we just end it. And it's like, well, that's really, that's like you play Monopoly, right? It's got the, Monopoly has the exact same fatal flaw. That's the worst thing that is wrong with Monopoly is also wrong with this game. That is not a good thing. Yep, But it has uh, another problem secondly, too around, these games definitely are very spreadsheet heavy in that the game itself is very like mathematically pure and you can calculate things. But in some games... There's no randomness yeah. except for the, the cards coming from the deck. What order will they appear? And you can see the future on those. So it's not very random. Yep. But the trouble is... Oh, Lord. Total aside. I'll get back to this later. People are commenting on our train game reviews on Board Game Geek. I okay, didn't know that was even sure. a thing. All right. Interesting. I'm going to skim those comments in a minute. So, uh, have fun with that. Basically, 
some games, like, it's just analysis paralysis. Like, you can calculate so far, but, like, doing a multi-turn full calculation of all player actions and possibilities will maybe give you, like, a 1% higher chance of winning the game. So it's not worth right, it Right, exactly. You see... Right, people talk about analysis paralysis a lot, and the, the usual pattern you see is exactly what Rim described, is that if you play the game and you are good at it, you have some heuristics for what's a good move, what's a bad move, you can play pretty well. You can get close to optimal play, or maybe even optimal play, uh, you know, by making a quick decision, or just, you know, looking around at your options and sort of picking the best one, yep. right, yeah, with various methods. But if you sit there and analyze every possible option down to the last dollar, down to every cent, down to the individual victory points, and say, aha, I thought of one that got me four victory points. It only took me 30 seconds to find that move. But I spent 10 minutes. I found a move <coughs> that gets me five victory points. Yep. Right? That's usually most, most games. Everdell has that problem to the nth degree. <coughs> you literally can just fucking sit there forever, and you might actually find a path through all those unique and semi-unique cards that gets you one more victory point than the other options. But... Right. That so is table in this stakes game, in this game. You have to do right, that in this to game, be able to engage with the game. Exactly. Because of the increasing prices on the private companies, right? Every player, right, must do analysis paralysis, math, 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 spend a lot of time thinking, right, down to the last dollar, exactly how much am I going to spend in this auction? What's my turn order? How much will I... What, what stock price will I open this company yep. at? How many shares will I issue? There's so many options of things you can do. You have to explore each and every one of them, you know, spreadsheet all the way out to before you make your move because a failure to do so won't mean one less victory point yep. or one less dollar. It means dollar your chance of victory literally crashes to right. zero that turn. It crashes from 90% to 5% and then from 5% to 0% over two turns. Right. It, it means, well, that means you're not going to have enough, you know, the next turn, the cheapest private company available will cost a minimum of $21 and you'll have $20. So you can't even participate. If you even had the, and that's the thing, if you had the $21, right? that could, you know, for, to buy that cheapest company, you might not buy it. Someone else with like $30 might just buy it for 22, yep. but you but you mattered. You forced them to buy that company. They couldn't buy another company because that would mean letting you have that one, right? If they chose a different company for say, you know, $27 yep. that you couldn't even afford, they got that at face value, but now they're giving you the 21 at face value, helping you out a ton. So now they have to buy that 21 to keep you out of it. Right. And when they do so, they have to buy it for 22 above face value because to not bid 22 would mean you would, could get it in there for 21 based on the turn order, possibly. Right. So having enough money to just clear that edge every single time requires a lot of analysis just to stay in the game. Yep, right. but even then, um, even if even once you get to that point, because the game's so dollar tight, what'll happen is even if you make a slight miscalculation, but otherwise are staying ahead of that ledge, like you're playing the game well, you've learned it, you're spreadsheeting it, you're doing your math, you're not going to get screwed. Like you can engage in the game meaningfully all the way to the end. You're behind by $2 of net worth by the third round. You'll never catch up. There's no way to catch up because since the game is so locked tight, while there's this, like, I can make a million corporations, corporations can sell stuff between each other. There's all this stuff that could happen in the stock market. I could, like, unload a company that sucks on someone and then, like, sell all the stock and do cool stuff. Someone could be trying to start a new company and buy all the privates from their old company into the new one, and you could try to buy that old company out before they're able to transfer and steal all the private companies yep, from they them. issue extra shares. All you kinds buy of shenanigans. The bank, but in practice, and I was looking around online... And it's not just our games. It seems like that's pretty common. Very rarely do shenanigans like that happen because they can't often happen if the players are all actually playing well. They seem to only happen in games of this where all the players are doing very badly or for whatever reason, some of the players are making very poor decisions. Yes, there's. if you, like we said, do all that analysis, you can basically protect yourself from any sort of shenanigan uh, that could possibly happen, right? Is no one can. There's no really like an attack someone can do that you can't defend yep. against. The only thing that someone can do um, in this game 
is to gang up on you with some sort of politics situation, right? Some cooperations uh, of people who are not in first place could unseat someone in first place, right? Put their put their monies together, um, you know, in some way, right? Just like someone who has been uh, mathematically eliminated from the game early could do some king making in this game, right? Uh, which is, you know, I, I like a king making, but I only like it personally when the king making happens. And the person doing the king making still has a chance to well, I win, guess, right? They've chosen. Yeah, I see where you're going. This with political that. path. I, I, they've chosen this political path through the game, even though they could, they, they themselves could still win after following that path. If somebody king makes and either a sacrifices all their chance to win to do so, or b king makes after already having crossed the point where they could no longer win. Like, well, I can't win this game. I'm going to put all my stuff yep. in with Rim to make him win or to make Rim lose. That just seems like a spoiler. And it's like, now you're not winning at least in based, root, on your mer- based on your like own in merit. Root, if right? you're behind, but you've played competently, like you're not just like derping around in the game, then holding back winners and just trying to keep the game going gives you some chance, some avenue to sneak a win in if everyone else stalemates. Like there's, a, there are still more plausible paths to victory than in games like this. But there's also this problem yeah. that I see where I, in, there's all these shenanigans that seem really fun. Like in 18 XX games, the most fun thing in the world to do is to fuck someone over and force them to buy a train or force someone to yep. own a company they don't want to own. But if yep. the players are even remotely careful, you really can't pull that off. Nope. It only happens to people who are, who are new at the game or don't know so what's these games up. Right? End up once, like, I, once I learned that, st- it took me quite a while to figure out how that worked. But basically, that doesn't happen to yep. me anymore. I'm like perfectly protected You can't throw a shitty company at me in 1889. Like, it just can't happen. Nope, it's I already know, I know how it works now, and now it never happens, and I can't do it to anyone else because they but know. But then better, we get in a situation right? where I like the train game, but the most fun of the table is when the turn starts and someone says, "Oh shit, I see what's about to happen," and then someone gets screwed by that. But you never see that happen when everyone's good again, unless people are making mistakes. So we have this broader problem of there are fun systems and levers in these games, much like Settlers of Catan, where trading is really fun. Where if you get good at the game. You'd never pull that lever again. Like, you know, that lever is just poison. There's no reason to ever touch it. Well, it's like, you know, I think baseball actually is an example of a game that has a lot of the same things outcomes. going on. If you ever, if you ever watch a, yeah, if you ever watch a little league baseball game, something that happens a lot in not the lowest level of little league, which is just kids who aren't, but like the middle school kids who like could be really good high school yep. players might like be they're little trying, league world series but they kinda. can't hit home runs what? yet because they're tiny, tiny kids. Well, well, they can't, they can in the little True. tiny field. But the point is, um, some things that you'll see happen, for example, are like successful steals yep. of home, right? Some things else that you'll see is that kids will get a walk, right? So the pitcher will walk the batter. The, the kid will run to first base, even though they just got walked. And, it's, and they'll just keep running to second, like without yep. stopping. And this will often fool uh, a, a pitcher, right, who is not, you know, who's just a kid who hasn't, who isn't aware in of that. In high school, my go-to right? move was I would walk casually toward first when I got uh, uh, walked. And then... I'd walk a little bit past it and then I would just suddenly sprint to second and no one ever was able to stop me. Right. In Major League Baseball, you see that never. You haven't seen stealing home in like it's super, super rare, yep. but not, it has it hasn't been common since like, like Jackie if a Robin. pickle happens like, in a professional baseball game, that is the highlight of the fucking month. Right, exactly. It, it happens pretty rarely. The it happens more pickles happen a but little even bit. Not but that still often. Still, pickles are one of the most fun parts of baseball. But they're they really right. can't happen unless you make a mistake. Right. So that's what I'm saying is that rolling stock. Even if your players aren't pro, right? Because the bar to just stay in the game is high. Anyone who's not pro can't do anything in this game. So as a result, you only get the game where everyone's pro and only boring stuff yep. happens, right? The exciting stuff. I'm really curious, right? I, have, I mean, I have tons of ideas on how to sort of take the core yeah. of these and games. If you didn't notice, we're playing game. a lot of these games but, lately for research for an idea we have. Yeah. But I'm just thinking like, what if you just, instead of making the game money tight, right? What if everyone started the game with like a fucking thousand dollars, right? Just don't change anything else. Just make everyone a fucking tycoon. Like you're rich. Money's not yep. tight. All right, now bid on these companies, right? It's like if you don't do, it doesn't matter how much money you start with as long as everyone starts the same 
And it's like, well, you ha- you can't just sit on your thousand dollars because if you want to win, you have to increase your money yep. somehow. But also, right? it means so now there's a lot more. If everyone's rich around right. issuing more everyone's shares and rich. buying shares and fucking other exactly. people's shares over. Everyone's rich. You can't kick anyone out of the game because they're all fucking rich. You just have to work the system to make more money than someone else, despite being yep. more rich. Right, that that you can't kick anyone out. They're not going to go bankrupt. They're a zillionaire. Everyone's a zillionaire. You're feuding tycoons, but you still have to play the game because you still have to make get to thousand and one dollars yep. somehow. Like what? Right? Di- You're not going to get it by but sitting. Instead, unless you hope everyone else loses money and you'll just sit. Like just what disappoints me the most is, awesome. is we can form all these companies, but there's almost never a reason to form more of them. You're like you can't. There later in the game there is, but there isn't a reason to form like a whole yeah. bunch. It's like you could legally form like five companies right away, but like that won't do anything except yep. make you lose. And in fact, in the last game we played, I formed a big company that's actually doing really well late game only because why not? I mean, I was already guaranteed losing the game and it was just a system I could interact with. Star Corp doesn't matter or mean anything to anyone. Yeah, no, I, uh, the first game I played, I started a company and I followed the basic heuristic of try to make a stock price go up. So I did, I got a company and it made its stock price go way, way up. I was, res- I was trying <laughs> to role play a responsible, a responsible corporate. No, 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 you got to role play a jerk. And that absolutely did not work. And I just got completely screwed. So it's like the, the, not only do you have to spreadsheet the whole game to stay in it, but your basic you know, real world heuristics of own a company and make the stock price go up. That's good. It's like, no, it's not, right? You, you have to do in, in, non-intuitive things are the way forward, right? Of course, um, Chris points out in the chat that I kind of agree with. See- if you started people with too much money in this game, I feel like never investing and never doing anything except maybe buying a couple of companies would actually be an optimal strategy because of the math. Because <laughs> I maybe, remember this happened then- when I was a kid in middle school this one random day, it was in like the eighth grade advanced math class, and they busted out Monopoly. They made us break into groups, and they were like, everyone play Monopoly, and uh, the winner from each table will like get a lottery ticket to get a thing. Like, there was a prize. Like, there's a real prize that people wanted, like a serious prize. I don't remember what the prize was. It was like, it was, it was like the Andy. equivalent of like, don't have to do homework for a couple of weeks. Like, it was some big deal thing. So everyone starts trying to play Monopoly, and at our table, I'm like, guys... Monopoly sucks. We don't want to play it. Uh, let's... J- oh, and there was a secondary prize. Here's the other piece. The secondary prize was whatever player had the most money among all the winners would win some other prize in addition. So I just mm-hmm. said, let's all just agree that we never take any actions in this game. There's a guaranteed five-way tie for first, and all we do is go around collecting the $200 from Go over and over and over again. Oh yeah, infinite, infinite go. go. Yeah. And uh yeah, we made sure there was a five-way tie at our uh, table and we had an order of magnitude more money than anyone else and the prize was canceled, everything was called off and we all got in trouble. Well, they should have uh, <laughs> thought about what they yeah. were doing. I would have I would if I saw kids doing that, I would be like you got you guys, I'm getting you five prizes. Yeah. Jesus. Yeah, that if I were a teacher, I would definitely reward the kids who were subversive in clever ways. I mean, we could, that's, I think our show's over, but definitely uh, there is, you know, I think one of the great injustices of that I, I think a lot of Pete nerds, especially, right, have experienced in American mm-hmm. school is adults punishing children for children being smarter. It's like you're there to learn and then they punish you for knowing more than adults yep. do, right? Uh, good adults will reward children who are smart, oh, outsmart adults and say, good you know job. What? As long as the kids didn't cause the reward harm. It doesn't even right? be that much. The reward could be like the teacher aside being like, yo kid, you don't have to do homework for the next two weeks. Don't tell anyone. That would have been enough. Yep. I would have stopped causing trouble. Anyway. <laughs> but yeah, Rolling Stock, if you want to uh, play this game, rollingstock.net has an online implementation because the game is so free. abstract. It's, you, you don't need anything. The fiction right. of this game is meaningless. No, no, no. Yes, you can read a PDF to get the complete. There's sever- a few PDFs that are available to read the whole rules, and then you can play online for free. If you want to play this online for free, contact us, and we'll play. I'll yeah. play with you. Uh, and well, we can chat, and we can talk to you, and I'll give you tips based on my two or three plays of it. But so I think far. the game is uh, what the I've game learned. Is only much like the 18xx games. I like it, but I think it is fatally and deeply flawed in specific and profound ways. While I enjoy it and it's interesting, it is more instructive 
then it is enjoyable. Like I am learning things about game design playing these games. I'm also seeing the flaws in them. And I still feel like between 18xx games and this, there is a game that can be made that is good in the traditional sense, not just good in the, I want to bang my head against the spreadsheet and see what happens sense. Right. Well, I think that's because all these games have in common some core mechanics that do not exist at all in other genres of games, uh, period, right? And so if we can extract those and just fix all the stuff around them and get rid of the problems, then you can make some tr- a truly like unique, amazing, popular Which game. Which I still uh, think comes down to... everyone could enjoy. It can't actually be a tabletop game. It needs to have primarily tabletop sensibility, but real-time markets or more slightly more complex stock markets that don't have fiddly rules, like no two companies can be the same price at the same time, that would go a long way toward making this better. I think there are, there are ways to do it, but anyway, let's uh, let's go find. Yeah, some I'm games. getting hungry. So yeah, stay safe out there. Enjoy uh, enjoy some rolling stock. If you guys want to play, we will play a game, and we can all be in misery together as literally no one can afford the last companies. This has been Geek Nights with Rim and Scott. Special thanks to DJ Pretzel for the opening music, Kat Lee for web design, and Brand OK for the logos. Be sure to visit our website at frontrowcrew.com for show notes, discussion, news, and more. Remember, Geek Nights is not one, but four different shows. SciTech Mondays, Gaming Tuesdays, Anime Comic Wednesdays, and Indiscriminate Thursdays. Geek Nights is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 license. Geek Nights is recorded live with no studio and no audience. But unlike those other late shows, it's actually recorded at night.